Terrific. Wow, that, that was really outstanding, uh, Indu. Um, I, I'd have to admit, you know, uh, this, this is probably one of the best talks I've heard in this topic. And then and you're obviously uh, you know, paving the, the way in, in, this, in this arena. Uh, many of us uh, clinicians only think about, you know, pharmacologic uh, options for Parkinson's. And then, and then when patients talk about natural things that they can do or non-pharmacologic approaches to uh, management of Parkinson's, I'd have to admit that many clinicians are not open to those or have much knowledge about, about this thing. So I'm, I'm really happy that, that, that you're, you're, you're really exerting a lot of your efforts and, and your talent in, in this respect. Now, uh, and I encourage people to, uh, the audience to submit uh, questions in the chat box, but I'm gonna get started with a few. Uh, what were the challenges for you in, in, in managing your Parkinson's patients during this pandemic? Well, what, what things were, were, were more easy and what things were more difficult uh, and what things went wrong during the pandemic? Yeah, so I mean, I think the challenges for all of us is missing seeing each other, you know, in person and being able to touch each other and the sense of, you know, the many of us went into medicine to be able to you know, connect directly with our patients and hug them and, you know, smile and see the smiles and be able to connect. So that was a huge challenge, um, you know, let alone not being able to see my family and, and you know, folks. And, you know, that was missing that sort of, you know, resonance and the, the in-person vibes, um, you know, or having to wear masks even when we were in person, it's been stressful and not touch our patients. So that, that first and foremost is something that has been a huge, you know, problem um, as part of the pandemic. I think the virtual modalities have been exciting because we've been able to access some people that we may never have been able to access. Um, some of my patients drive six hours to come see me or fly in from other parts of the country. And I think being able to give some care virtually has been exciting, but you know, um, not everyone has the ability to connect. I think we've missed a lot of our patients who can't do you know, digital um, solutions. You know, they, they can't hear on the phone, they can't, um, they can't operate a device that's complex. And, um, you know, I think they, these are not easy things to join Zoom meetings or, you know, virtual visits. And so we're excluding people who may not be able to understand the technology. And so that's been a loss. And even at the VA, often we were only able to do phone calls in some patients. And as movement doctors, that means that we are only, you know, it gives us a lack of being able to, to, to examine people in a certain way and write out things for them and to be able to help them comply. So that, that was, um, an additional, you know, layer of, of problems. On top of that, I think, you know, the, the real, the, many of patients on many of these virtual visits were saying that they were doing quite well, or that, you know, they didn't really complain about a lot of things. And now that we're seeing people back, I think the effects of um, being mentally and physically um, disconnected from certain types of exercises and also people and, and the world and going out of their homes, has been um, impactful in terms of even cognitive um, sorts of when we measure things like MOCA scores, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, or we're examining people from their motor standpoint. I think people have, you know, been been somewhat derailed in terms of the they may have been on a trajectory, and I think that that some things are worse. And I really hope and believe that we can re-rail our patients and help them get better, get get reconnected, and that we, you know, that we can help bring people back uh, from that sort of um, derailment in terms of cognitive changes, in terms of isolation and other things. So I think these are some of the practical problems that I've seen, and um, you know, we're really trying to now re-engage patients, um, being able to see them again has been beneficial and help them understand how, um, you know, they, they have some of this lack of engagement and, and proactive choices have, have affected them. So, so that's sort of been my um, sort of sense of things. Um, maybe I could also ask you, uh, you know, Dr. Evadete, what you've seen as well um, in terms of your challenges. Yeah, um, well, it's, it, first of all, in, in the virtual world, it, it's kind of, hard to really assess um, the, the physical deterioration of patients, especially so that your, your exam is obviously limited. And many of my patients also, uh, especially the elderly ones, uh, are, are really not Zoom savvy. And therefore, you know, most of them have flip phones even, right? And so, so talking about Zoom and, and, and these virtual platforms is, is so foreign to them. So it's, it's really hard for me to, to 
to gauge some of these patients of mine. And, and sometimes when I don't see them for a year or so, uh, and just doing you know virtual assessments, and by the time I see them, a lot of them are, are, are really in, in bad shape, in terrible shape, and I don't really get the good feedback uh, that I would uh, from a good exam, you know. And and I, I think uh, you brought you brought up also uh, you know an important point of, of of seeing and touching and 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 seeing your patient smile and and, and you interacting directly uh, with them. There's something lost uh, in the virtual world uh, that that just doesn't make up for that actual you know connection between you and the patient in, in a live uh, in a live setting and, and believe it or not whereas you know back in, in 2020 where, whereas there was an initial shock uh, the first few months after the pandemic broke out and 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 almost all my patients wanted to go virtual um, after about three to four months even before the vaccines came out believe it or not uh, many of my patients, when we call them for uh, for uh, follow-ups, and we kind of say, "Okay, uh, would you want to come in?" versus you know, do a te tele follow-up. Many of my patients, actually, believe it or not, would, would take the risk and just come over to my office and just want to you know connect directly uh, with me. Uh, and so, um, and so those those were the more or less the challenges that 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 I, that I encountered you know during this pandemic. Now I also see patients where where uh, they're very heavy on on naturopath you know interventions and 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 some of my I would say some of some of my very uh, frustrating cases were those that I, I know that the Western medicines would help them and yet you know they're so uh, they're so uh, engrossed in 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 natural means like exercising yoga uh supplements and so on and so forth and then what's even what even pains me more is is that they they end up seeing naturopaths that do all sorts of interventions like uh, chelation therapy and high dose supplements and, and so on and so forth so how do we strike a balance between yeah. western medications and interventions and these yeah. natural uh, uh interventions yeah that's a really good question so um so I think that um, a few things. So, you know, when we talk about integrated medicine, it's literally like integrating this with this. So it, the the historical I, sort of term for that was complementary and alternative medicine, which I don't like the word alternative because it makes it seem like it's one or the other. Right, but right. A big believer in, you know, um, levodopa and DBS and the right symptom sort of profiles, I believe that we need both. And I think we need to start opening our mind to the fact that as clinicians, we um, don't have all the answers to all the symptoms. So we have good motor treatments, I think in general, we are able to help motor disease um, to some degree, but this non-motor issues, we have very little that moves the needle and that really often affects quality of life tremendously in our patients. We also have to understand where the patients are coming from. I, you know, when we do surveys, 60% of Parkinson's patients are doing some kind of um, integrative modality. And yeah. we, they don't tell us because we shut it down when they come into our office. And so I'd rather know and be part of a dialogue and be open than have patients not come in and then, or, or not tell me about whole things that may actually from a safety issue be conflicting or you know be problematic for me to not know about. So I really think it's important that our patients are hungry for this. I'm trying to meet them where they are. I've you know, found that for me, it helped me with certain aspects of my own life. So I started attracting patients that were interested in yoga, which is why I ended up getting quite in, in, more and more interested. And I think we do have, we're starting to get data. So it's not that we don't have any scientific proof of some of these, especially lifestyle um, choices that I think are part and parcel of actually healthy aging in general. There's nothing terribly unique about some of what I told you uh, that is different for an Alzheimer's patient versus even longevity, you know, like talking to people about how to age well. I think many of us, if we think about even as clinicians in the pandemic, we had to stick to many of these things just to get through, you know, some of the very stressful timeframes, much of this is what we talk to each other about and what we are trying to do for ourselves. So it's, it's nothing terribly unique, but I think, so I'm not talking about getting off of levodopa. I'm not talking about, um, you know, I tend to give levodopa actually, and our colleague, the naturopath is actually a big believer in levodopa in order to feel optimally well motor controlled so that you can participate more in socially connecting, participate in more in the lifestyle choices and exercise to the fullest. We don't want to do the body a disservice 
by depriving a chemical that's missing and then trying to go crazy with exercise yoga because that's actually dangerous. The other thing that I'll say is that you know, largely a lot of the schools of medicine, so traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, it's not taking turmeric, putting it in a powder form and then putting it in a capsule and then sticking it in some body part. It's really about more of a holistic lifestyle approach. So the notion that you, um, you know, are living um, in a way that is um, in, in sort of a balance with the environment that you live in, that you respect the plants, you eat seasonally, you're eating um, turmeric from in curries, you cook it with pepper, you cook it with ghee, which is like a, you know, um, something that's a fat that uh, helps you to absorb it. In fact, when we take any one of these things and we try to control them and randomize them in, in Western ways and try to extract just this component, often these fail. And that's because, you know, it's really more of this whole lifestyle approach. And I think any one component may not be the solution. It's really this more holistic sort of thing. So I think we have to sort of picture it in the sort of setting of, you know, you as the person living in your environment, what speaks to you, what brings you meaning. Um, but I think we've really done a disservice to not educate around any of this historically. A lot of the times, traditionally, you know, a patient would come in, they'd complain of a motor thing, we check a motor scale, we would then give them a pill, see them back in six months, there was very little tweaking of anything or a sense that they should be doing anything in the meantime. And I think patients are really wanting to know what they can do to change the course. And so they were then finding each other and realizing that, oh, this exercise seems to help or that this person looks better. And as Jim wrote here uh, in the chat, I'm a patient of yours. Dr. Evidente has integrated 30 minutes of exercise five times a week, some body scan meditation, general meditation, as well as eating healthier. And when you do some of this stuff, you feel better. So, you know, um, taking medications as prescribed along with the techniques I mentioned above have really helped. So, um, so it's really combination. It's not one or the other. Um, and I think it's partnering with the people who are providing your care, being open-minded as a neurologist, that as a Parkinson's neurologist, I'm not the only source of all this information that I work as you have a whole team of people that put this thing together here, that it's not, you know, just any one of us way we can, you know, farm out some of the care. The patients can get some help from maybe somebody that they trust in their community that may not wear a white coat at all. It might be a physical therapist or somebody else that can be engaged to help them stay on the path, check in with them and make them feel better as part of the therapeutic sort of relationship that is gained. And that I, I mean, a lot of care for Parkinson's patients in the world is not being done by a neurologist, let alone a movement disorder specialist. It's really, you know, general practitioners that have very limited time to know about this stuff. And so we have to engage the resources that we have in the community, um, I just came from, the reason I came to Arizona was to work with um, the, the power folks, the PWR, um, you know, the, the um, physical therapists that have re really defined how to work with these patients. And they, they are so energetic and so knowledgeable and they spend so much time learning about what matters to patients. They're teaching me stuff, you know? So I think it can be a dialogue from the patients, from the people who are spending the time day to day with the patients, the caregivers, everyone needs to work together to sort of own some of this so that we can really move the needle because I think the traditional approach of, um, you know, the paternalistic approach of an, you know, a clinician just knowing all the answers and giving you the answer as a patient and then the patient's just passive obviously is not the only right solution to my eye. Yeah. And then it's, it's you, you, you highlight the, 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 uh, usefulness for yoga, but is this something that any Parkinson's patient can participate in? Yes, yeah, so I mean, I think, yeah, so I think that if you look at many of these practices in essence, so yoga is not, I mean, we, we unfortunately brand all of this stuff. We brand Parkinson's as a disease of those pictures of, you know, we have to sort of get more educated, I think, about all of these things. So yoga um, was actually brought to the West by um, BKS Iyengar, and he was somebody who in his teens almost died because wow. he could barely breathe, he could barely walk down the street. He People had written him off and they were like, you, we don't have anything to offer you. So he went into a yoga sort of uh, practitioner and he started working on breath work and was able to rehab himself there. And then he's taught yoga over a lifetime and really rehabbed himself as somebody who lived in, in a body that was really almost on death's door from TB or something. 
Then when he was in his 60s, I believe, he got in a big car accident and could barely walk. And then he used yoga with the modifications to again, rehab himself. And then he finally wow. passed away, I think in his 90s. So he embodied really a sort of a sense of, but you know, yoga again is meditation, breath work, and the breath work is very teachable. And then there's the poses and the poses are, you know, yes, that they're, they're fanciest can be, you know, um, fancy, you know, one-handed cartwheels and, um, you know, uh, handstands, but really you can do yoga. As I showed you, one of my collaborators is, um, in a wheelchair and teaches yoga to spinal cord injured patients. And some of the effects just are amazing of just, you know, the right cues and, and even somebody who has a high C-spine transection or, uh, uh, ALS patient, really advanced disease, even into the palliative care, death and dying populations, they're able to offer some of the benefits. So I think, again, if you're thinking that this is not accessible to you, I would, you know, try to connect with maybe a local, local provider, teach them about your disease. Many of them are interested, and that's why we're trying to teach yoga teachers how to work with our patients. And this is a very modifiable thing that can really, you know, be um, sort of found, uh, find some class, maybe a chair class, um, and, you know, see, but again, safety is important. Mm -hmm. We don't want people to walk into, you know, an advanced class in a, or a 24 hour, you know, fitness studio and just do like what everybody else is doing without, you know, giving feedback to the teachers. So, but I think a lot of the benefits of this Tai Chi, there is something for everyone that we can do. Um, and if you're not getting something, then maybe you're not with the right, you know, sort of teacher. I think you want somebody who's open-minded, who is understanding of what, where you are, um, but it, yes, yoga can absolutely be taught even in somebody who's barely can move anything, um, you know, a, at all. Um, as I showed you that video, of the, I mean, the, um, the picture of Matthew Sanford, who is a highly inspirational, you know, teacher to me and, and can, it is, is, is actually paralyzed from his chest. Wow. Down. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about boxing? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> So I think um, boxing is great. I mean, I think boxing, um, I, I mean, I'm not very, uh, if most people who know me know that I'm very, very open-minded to a lot of things. And if you love something, then you're going to do it. So find what you love and tell yourself, write down what you love in all of those bubbles. You know, when you think about it, like, what, what do I love to do? Who do I love to spend my time with? What did I love to do? And if you can't, you know, I give these talks to people and they're like, oh, you know, I kind of forgot that I actually really like to do this, or I've always wanted to try to learn Italian, or I, I never got a chance to do this because I was too busy. Well, try it, right? So so if you love boxing, um, you know, um, there's some great rock steady boxing or different types of boxing folks all over. And, and many people are getting engaged in things that they never thought they could do. I think, um, you know, I think there's a tremendous benefit to, again, that group experience and the mind body sort of, you know, coordination and they do some stretching and they, you know, um, so I think there's something for everyone there. And I, I have a lot of patients who love boxing. I have a lot of patients who there's um, folks that have done karate for Parkinson's, rock climbing for Parkinson's. I mean, you name it. We've had blogs and Mike and I have been, you know, working around all kinds of folks and been very open-minded singing groups for Parkinson's. So I think, again, find things you love and find a partner and maybe start a group. And if you don't have it in your community, maybe, you know, think about it in an open-minded way. But I'm extremely open to, and I just came from that retreat. There was a Bollywood dance class at that retreat. There was all kinds of fun things. So, um, you know, I think that it's really about connecting and getting into that sort of enjoying, enjoyable place. And, um, you know, uh, if you can get your heart rate up as well, it, it's definitely a bonus. So. Yeah, yeah. And then you mentioned about exercise and about having, you know, your recommendations is 30 minutes per day, maybe six and seven days per week. But how, how does one know whether the exercise is effective or not? So that's a good question. I mean, I think that when you talk to people like Boss Blom, um, they will say that if you can do something where at a pace in which you, um, you know, just to break it down, because I mean, a lot of these, um, you know, sort of uh, like studies, research studies in which we're putting people on a treadmill and measuring their heart rate, and it's all very complicated. And, you know, you need to get to 80% of this max. I think a simple, quick and dirty thing from a cardio perspective is if you can do something and you're slightly out of breath where you can still carry on a conversation, but it's a little hard for you to, you know, quite talk comfortably, that's probably a good pace. And if you can do that for 30 minutes, five days a week, I think that's reasonable. Um, I think a lot of the studies that are coming out, there was a, a Korean study that just came out that was like, I think four hours a week of relatively like moderate, light to moderate, mm -hmm. so even some housekeeping, I was like, 
who wants to do housekeeping for four hours a week? I mean, that was like, you know, not what I want my patients to be doing. I want them to be doing fun things, getting out in nature, you know, like going for a hike or going for a walk, you know, saying hi to their neighbors, you know? So again, mix it up, whatever you're going to do that you like doing and that's sustainable. If you can find a friend and do it, that's sort of the best. So um, those are those sorts of things. I'm not very, um, you know, sort of married to you have to do this or have to do that because I think it's when people feel extremely like they have no choices and we give them something that there's no way in hell that they would ever be able to do. like I'm not going to go to the gym and sweat on a treadmill like that's not ever I, I'd rather be set on fire than do that so why <laughs> would I tell my patients to do that you know what I mean so I think we have to make things accessible so you know if some of you enjoy praying on Sunday with your your church group and then you can have a picnic go for a walk you know for 10 20 minutes uh for some part of that then you mix it up and you you know get a few benefits of all of these things so i think you know you have to make it something that people are going to want to do or they're not going to do it yeah and, and, and you know i have some patients that push it to the extreme though like i have a patient that that does maybe 60 or 70 miles of walking every week which is a lot and he's like 75 years old or something so, so is there, is there such a thing as overdoing exercising? Yeah. I mean, so when we talk about that, I mean, I think in any area of medicine, there are those people who have, um, had that, um, you know, uh, sort of overdoing X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And you know, there Almost are like compulsion. Yes. So I think in the impulse control world, there are people, I've had some patients who exercise sort of at uh, like, you know, where they overdo some things like to a point where you're just like so restricted with their diet or so this or so right, that. Right. And so I think that there are, if you're, if you're hurting yourself, if you're harming yourself, if you need to take pain medicine because you're overdoing it or your, your doctors or other doctors are saying you've trashed every joint in your body. And I have patients like that. They have one knee surgery after the other, and then a hip and then it is. And then they've, in, if you're constantly injuring yourself, then I think you have to sort of revisit a little bit, maybe check in with the physical therapist, think about, you know, what are the benefits? What are the risks of the things that you're doing? I do think that sometimes people do get these endorphins. So they get these chemicals released yeah. that help the non-motor issues. And those are definitely a good thing that we have to honestly balance risk versus benefit with everything we try to do um, in aging bodies, um, bone health. You know, if you're harming your, um, you know, I, I think in needing excessive surgeries or something else is happening, you're in horrible pain and you're pushing through it and taking pain medicine just to be able to get that then maybe we're not you know this is not the right prescription for you and we have to modify it so so i think many of these things should be accessible and safe as well um and i think you know again on the question about on the supplements that you would ask me um the fda doesn't regulate supplements and so we have to be quite mindful of when patients think that they're getting I'm taking curcumin or you know turmeric or whatever in this pill. We don't really know what's in a lot of those supplements or even yeah, probiotics. We don't know what's in some of these. So I think if you can get it from natural dietary sources, if you can think about you know good ways to get some of these things um, that are you know from the source, then that's the best. Um, we don't really. Want, I don't personally send people to the to the supplement store to take every vitamin and and um, you know supplement out there. I think there are so certain things labs that can be checked b12 for example deficiency is quite common vitamin d is another thing sure. um bone health you know if your calcium is very low things like that that makes sense otherwise a balanced diet with got lots of fresh fruits and vegetables lots of fiber good hydration most things can actually be gotten from those sorts of things including the gut microbiome will be quite happy if you can get Absolutely. that dietary sort of thing yeah. One last question before we take a break. Uh, do you have any tips for patients with poor appetite? I, I really struggle with my Parkinson's patients are losing weight. They're trying yep. their very best to eat, but they just can't get, you know, enough in, you know, for them to gain weight. So you have any any yeah. tips for those kind of patients? Yeah. So one of the things that happens with Parkinson's is that the sense of smell gets affected and then that right. affects the sense of taste. So I think that, you know, increasing and and the Good news in some ways about Parkinson's is that since blood pressure is usually on the low side, 
salt can be liberally added. Um, and, and so we can make food a little tastier. A lot of our patients are usually not overweight with Parkinson's. So you're able to add fat, healthy fats, healthy um, things that you, you know, even ice cream sometimes. Um, I'm not a huge stickler. I know some patients are worried about dairy. I think if you enjoy dairy and you love ice cream and you're too nutritionally sort of low, then adding things like dairy, um, ensure, you know, if you and buy a bunch of different types of ensure and try all of them. And if you like one, then enjoy that one, you know? So I think liberally trying to expand your calories and the things that you love to eat, you don't have to be eating necessarily healthy if you've, you've lost um, too much weight. And then adding more fresh herbs um, sometimes can make things a little bit tastier and then also amping up the spices because, because that sense of smell is not there. Sometimes right. we have to excessively, you know, add some things. So you may need um, and I know I have had wives of patients be like, he used to love my spaghetti sauce and now he doesn't eat it. And I'm so sad. Well, maybe we have to, um, you know, for his portion, add, add more spice and more, you know, stuff if the rest of the family doesn't want it. But those are some ideas. Okay, there's, there's one question for you here. Uh, you want to read it, uh, Indu? Yeah, it says, I'm a, is that the one? I'm right hand, oop. Hi, I'm Dr. Subramanian. Yeah. So. yeah. Hi, Dr. Subramanian. I'm a right-handed whose right arm has stiffened due to Parkinson's, yet I continue to play tennis using the set arm. Could, could I be doing it more damage than good? So we, we definitely don't want a ton of asymmetry and untreated symptoms. So I would definitely look at the patient uh, if I was seeing them and see if they need levodopa treatment um, to improve that disability motor-wise. And then, then once that's better, then they'll be able to exercise to the fullest and we won't be putting joints at risk. Sometimes we injure hips or you know shoulder joints because one limb is not moving as well as the other, and we tend to favor that you know then. So and then we can lead to injury and then back issues and other problems. So definitely go see your doc and check that out because um, we do want you exercise. We want to do it safely. And then on the question about the satiety and the appetite, sometimes if people are also having dyskinesia, that's excessive. They can burn calories and have weight um, loss. And so, um, you know, if people are having good input and weight, losing weight despite that, then I would definitely look at the bigger picture, make sure that there's nothing else going on. Sometimes, you know, a, a, a hormonal issue or um, cancer or things like that can also affect this. So we want to make sure that people are checking in with their doctors, getting their thyroid checked, other things. Um, and, and also that dyskinesias are not a huge problem because those can make people lose weight from too much caloric burn and we can adjust the medicine and hopefully help the dyskinesia. So, so, um, but thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. It was really lovely. Yeah, same here, same and here. Sorry we kept you too long. No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> I was trying to, to do all of the above, but this was- yeah, Absolutely. Fun, so. Outstanding. So I appreciate the opportunity. Outstanding. Okay. And have a safe trip back to LA. Thank you. Be thank well, you. everyone. Bye. Okay. <laughs>